present assistant professor of music here at UCLA. He has the Master of Arts degree from UCLA, a cum laude PhD in musicology from the University of Utrecht. In 1956 to 58, he enjoyed a Fulbright grant to the Netherlands. In 1963, he was a recipient of the University of California Faculty Summer Fellowship. Among his other duties at the moment, he is Director of Music of the Wilshire Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles. His principal publications are two books, one published by the University Press in 1956 on the style of J.S. Bach's Choral Preludes. A more recent work published by the University of Utrecht Press was on the organ music of Jan Petersen Swelink. I am very pleased to be able to present to you Professor Robert Tussler. Thank you, Professor Frankel. It seems almost an impossible task that the committee asked me to do this evening. And I hope with the help of Mr. Conant, our bass, and Master Charles Shillito, our treble, that we will be able to give you some experiences of this music of Shakespeare's time. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul. My soul, the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. And these same thoughts people this little world in humors like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort of thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word. As thus, come little ones, and then again, it is hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their pride. Thoughts tending to con content flatter themselves that they are the first of fortune's slaves. Nor shall not be the last like silly beggars who sitting in the stocks refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there and in this thought they find a kind of sense, a bearing of their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus I play, I, in one person, many people, and none contented. Sometimes I am a king, then reasons make me wish myself a beggar. And so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then I am kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke, and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I, nor any man that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased, till he be eased with being nothing. Music do I hear, mm. keep time. How sour sweet music is, when time is broke and no proportion kept. 
So it is in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the conquered of my state, in a disordered string, but for the conquered of my state and time, had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar their watches on until mine eyes the outward watch. Where to my finger, like a dial's point, is pointing still in cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart. Which is the bell? So sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times, and hours. But my time runs posting on in Bolingbroke's proud joy while I stand fooling here, his jack o' the clock. This music mads me. Let it sound no more. For though it hath hoped madmen to their wits, in me it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet blessing on his heart that gives it to me, for it is a sign of love, and love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Thus spoke Richard II from his prison at Pomfret Castle. And in so doing, he well describes Europe in the last half of the 16th century and early decades of the 17th century. As thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the word against the word, an uneasy conscience creates malaise and distrust. No longer are the authoritative answers so satisfying. The Reformation continues to grow. The world seems to become larger and more terrifying with each voyage and new account of that voyage. Blood baths and roaring fires continue to torment men of ideas and beliefs. Councils are held to bring about discipline and order. Remember the Council of Trent? We've been having a few in the 20th century. John Donne, contemporary of Will Shakespeare, the most profane and pious of all po poets and clergymen. He speaks directly to the problem. A new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost, and the earth, and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. Nor can the sun parfit a circle, or maintain his end, way one inch direct. But where he rose today he comes no more, but with a cozening line, steals by that point, and so is serpentine but yet confess, and in this the world's proportion disfigured is, that those two legs whereon it doth rely, reward and punishment are bent awry. And oh, it can no more be questioned that beauty's best proportion is dead. That's a bleak picture, isn't it? I have heard quite a few people speak the same of the 20th century. It's a very bleak picture. But proportion was dead because it was one of the most exciting periods of all time in the arts. There are more great artists uh, from 1520 to about 1650 than I can begin to name in the next 50 minutes. Such names immediately come to mind other than Shakespeare who tends to dominate England but such names as El Greco in Spain, as Titoretto in Italy, as Titian, as Monteverdi, on and on, great names and all great creative geniuses. 
Shakespeare was not alone. It seems as if it were a period when all was breaking to pieces and yet at the same time, great art was being produced. Great art which was full of human expression, full of communication, that bantered word of the 20th century, which people want to throw around constantly and measure by machines and computers. Shakespeare, Monteverdi, John Bull, Orlando Gibbons, etc., etc., on into the night, were not concerned about machines and communication, but they were concerned about man's feelings and the expression thereof. It comes as no surprise that the arts are frequently troubled, obscure, if not illogical, that the creator is highly subjective in his approach, intense, expressive, experimental, asymmetrical, twisted, or oblique space, distortion, perverseness, all words which come to mind when one thinks of El Greco, or Parmigianiano, or Jaswaldo. The old gives way to the new, or is transformed and given new life. I think in music of the Richer Carr, so carefully performed as a motet in the vocal style of the 15th and early 16th century, each interval having to be carefully prepared, each rhythm being smoothly worked into the next rhythm. But a Frescobaldi, a Svelink, and many others, a John Bull, would distort and twist those intervals until they become harsh, dissonant sounds. Dissonant sounds not so terribly unlike some 20th century music. The ideal proportions of a da Vinci or a Zarlino will not permit such violent, dramatic, affecting emotions as one experiences in Tintoretto's transporting the body of St. Mark. You remember the picture. It shows St. Mark, the beautiful, classic figure of St. Mark, heavy in death over in one corner, being carried by two other individuals. Behind this scene, behind this heavy weight, directly behind is a camel of unusual proportions, proportions which pull the picture down this way, and on the other side, you have a thin, sour color, which pulls you back into the picture down a very foreshortened perspective street. And in that street are ghost-like figures running for cover, because at the back of the canvas, the earth is being rent with a storm. Sour, bitter colors, dramatic and the beautiful, beautiful naked body of St. Mark heavily being carried as if the painting were to be carried in this fashion. Full of drum drama, full of humanity. Shocking, actually, to the hierarchy. Not at all what the church and the Council of Trent was prescribing. Nor will such classic injunctions make room for John Bull's chromatic fantasia. We in the 20th and 19th century were so shocked when they found that piece. Why, he must have known the well-tempered system, or how could he have gone through all those modulations? 
it still shocks when heard properly performed. Its shifting chromaticism and its harsh dissonances always make our ears tingle. Par <coughs> Parigiano, uh, par excuse me, Parvigiano, Madonna with the long neck. You remember this painting? Whose curving, elongated body, elegant, in the most beautiful draperies, not Baroque at all, because this dear lady is not earthbound at all. She is elegant. She is beauty personified with long, delicate fingers. And she is holding a child, the child Jesus, who is so pretty and long, unusually long. Everything is out of proportion. The perspective is m mere madness almost, because you look back behind the virgin, the so-called virgin, you wonder about her virginity, I assure you. You look behind her and you see a saint reading from the scriptures. One of the most emaciated, tiny, little figures you have ever seen in your life. Perfectly proportioned, except so thin and the bones sticking out. And in some of the back draperies, you would expect at any moment death to come out. Such a picture certainly shatters any eye notion of realism with regard to the Madonna. Yet realism there is. Realism at times employed as a virtuosi display of painterly technique. And in other instances, for shock, such as Titian's Venus and the organ player, with its obvious, most obvious sexual connotations. Certainly, self-appointed censures would find this pornography. Anyone who finds Mr. Miller's Tropic of Cancer disturbing would find Mr. Titian's Venus and the organ player far more suggestive. One is also reminded of such perfect realism as one can see in Bruegel's The Tower of Babel. Most of you look at The Tower of Babel and you see a rather strangely shaped tower spinning off into shape with, str with small like figures moving in toward this tower. This biblical story being reproduced in a rather strange, odd shaped manner. I recommend that you take a magnifying glass to the picture sometime and you will see on each level of the tower the most perfectly formed young men, old men, women, pregnant women, jackasses, everything you can imagine going into the Tower of Babel, all with perfect realism. Virtuosi technique only could have been done with magnifying glasses. A real trick just as many of the virtuosi tricks of a William Byrd on the virginal, or as a John Bull, or Jan Peterson Svelink in Holland, the virtuosi toccatas, and interestingly enough, you know, you've heard a lot about the Puritans, those horrid Puritans, as uh, one of our former speakers had to say, well, they were horrid in many ways. But the interesting thing is that they did not, in all the iconoclastic movement, they did not destroy one organ in the Netherlands. Not one. Nor did they in Germany. Nor did they in Switzerland, except uh, 
to melt the pipes down to make more guns to fight a war or to get money. In Holland, even under the bombarding of Philip and the flooding and the breaking of the dikes, etc., etc., the organs in the Netherlands were not destroyed. And the interesting thing is, those Calvinists never did give up their Genever, and they never gave up going to the church to hear organ music. And they will fight to this day in the Netherlands about what's going to happen to the town instrument. Three years ago, uh, no, about four years ago, Harlem was in an uproar because they were going to hire a Danish builder to rebuild their fine instrument at San Bavos Kirk. And for over a year, every day's newspaper carried another fight. Can you imagine in Los Angeles anyone getting excited about whether the organ was going to be rebuilt by somebody from Kansas or not? Uh-uh. Can you imagine anyone really getting very excited if the Philharmonic were blown up? I really don't think they would. Well, this was an exciting time, a strange mixture of things. Virtuosity, great piety, and all the musicians and painters showed this. Continuing with the idea of the visual arts, let me read what Shakespeare has to say. As usual, Shakespeare is sensitive. He is experiencing, apparently, everything in his culture. And he expresses exactly the aesthetic of the arts beautifully. Mine eye hath played the painter, and hath stelled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame wherein tis held, and perspective it is best painter's art. For through the painter must you see his skill, to find where your true image pictured lies, which in my bosom's shop is hanging still, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art, they draw, but what they see, know not the heart. And again, in The Rape of Lucrece, Shakespeare captures in words what the painter achieves. At last she calls to mind where hangs a piece of skillful painting, made for Priam's Troy, before the which is drawn the power of Greece, for Helen's rape the city to destroy, threatening cloud kissing Ilion with annoy, which the conceited painter drew so proud as heaven it seemed to kiss the turrets bowed. A thousand lamentable objects there, in scorn of nature, art gave lifeless life. Many a dry drop seemed a weeping tear, shed for the slaughtered husband by the wife. The red blood reeked to show the painter's strife, and dying eyes gleamed forth their ashy lights, like dying coals burnt out in tedious nights. For eleven more verses, Shakespeare leads us through a painting, which might have been by El Greco, Tintoretto, Bronzino, and much of it might have been sculpted by Cellini. He, we are led through perspectives which are twisted, through murky, sour colors, through minutia rendered in perfect realism, viewing great and triumphant commanders side by side with pale cowards and heartless peasants, mocked by scalps almost hid behind that seemed to jump up higher and higher as if to whirl into space. In some ways, we might be experiencing El Greco's unnerving burial of Count Orgoth with its child much like Lucrece, pointing the way. Death seems to dance in the shadows. And it did, remember, it did. 
think for a moment of how many gentlemen who have contributed to the arts and to the sciences at this time met death via the fire or on the chopping block. And thus the artist dominates, pulling our feelings from loving tenderness to violence, from destructive horror, sometimes gradually and then again abruptly. And you say, how can he speak so dramatically about music? Oh, yes. You must remember that our ears have been somewhat tainted. We have become so super sophisticated in our hearing, hearing and in our seeing uh, that um, we don't hear and we don't see very well anymore. Unless we're like Bob Hope, who says that we're all going to have eyes the size of melons because we watch television all the time. Well, but to the 16th, 17th century that also experienced a rather lot of horrifying things, as I've already accounted. Still, the music and the art had been, for only just a short time before, of a purer type, of a type which called for balance and order, and perspective was carefully controlled, and humanity was idealized. Humanism now has come down to the man in the street, and so the dirt of the street can be shown as well as the beauty of the palace. Shakespeare employs the musician's weapons of sound and rhythm to capture and project to the painter's canvas. Now even flowing, then proportion broken, lulling us with sweetness and then yanking us up with the dissonance of red blood reeked, forcing us to respond according to the affection. Though the written records, to my knowledge, do not state that Shakespeare was trained in the musician's art. His works reveal a superior sensitivity to its subtleties and an apparent immersion in the music of his time. Prevalent are dances such as canaries, carantos, bergamasques, and many others. The various types of choral and instrumental music appear in the plays or poetry. And no play, no play, is without a song to be accompanied by lute or other instruments. And that lovely play, uh, Winter's Tale, which will be performed later on campus, if you really study it, is almost like a musical comedy. There are so many songs in it. I hope they'd perform them all in one way or another. The various effects and properties and powers of music, which one could find discussed in the writings of the period dealing with music. I think of offhand Morley's plain and easy introduction to music appear discussed at some length. In The Merchant of Venice, Lorenzo speaks, how sweet the moonlight sweet sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness in the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica, look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdst, but in his motion an angel sings, still quiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in, in mortal souls. Again, the music of the spheres. And you know Kepler was dealing with the music of the spheres at this time. And Kepler, in the, at the end of one of his long treatises, even writes out the notes of the melodies formed by the rotating and whirling spheres. Interestingly enough, some of those actual motifs are employed by composers of the time in compositions. They, however, do not call them uh, music of the spheres. But whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Come, ho, and wake Diana with a hymn. With sweetest touches, pierce her mistress's ear and draw her home with music. 
And I remember uh, as a child the type of song which was to draw father home from the bar. They believed it then too. Jessica replies, in a very 20th century sophisticated way, by the way, I am never merry when I hear sweet music. Lorenzo continues, the reason is your spirits are attentive. For do but note a wild and wanton herd, or race of youthful and unhandled colts, fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, which is the hot condition of their blood. If they but hear perchance a trumpet sound, or any air of music touch their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand, their savage eyes turned to a modest gaze by the sweet power of music. I believe there was a romantic poet who said something about music uh, calming the savage breast or something like that. This is much more forcefully put. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones, and floods. Of course, typical of even the musicians of the day, Shakespeare shows his knowledge of the Orpheus story and the legend of the beginnings of music. We have to be learned in this period also. Since not so stockish, hard, and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. And this is the quote I like best of all. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with conquered of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Arabus. Let no such man be trusted. As a musician, I believe that wholeheartedly. I see one of my psychiatrist friends in the crowd. I'm sure that he will have some things to say to me after this lecture. Well, if Mr. Conant will help me out, mark the music. sounds to banish, banish friendly sleep. Thus wedded to my woes and a bird 
dead tomb, my tomb. Oh, let me living die. Oh, let me living, let me living, living die. Till death, till death do come, till death, till death do come, till death, till death do come. Come again, sweet love doth now invite thy graces that refrain to do me do delight to see, to hear, to touch, to kiss, to die with thee again in sweetest sympathy. To see, to hear, to touch, to kiss, to die with thee again in sweetest sympathy. Come again, that I may cease to mourn through thy unkind disdain. For now left and forlorn, I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die in deadly pain and endless misery. I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die in deadly pain and endless misery. Gentle love, draw forth thy wounding dart. Thou canst not pierce her heart. For I that to approve, by sighs and tears, more heart than are thy shards, did tempt while she, while she for triumph laughs. By sighs and tears, more heart than are thy shafts, did tempt while she, while she for triumph laughs. Mr. Conant has just performed for you the Hamlet-like song, In the Darkness Let Me Dwell, by Thomas Campion and John Dowland's Come Again, Sweet Love. Though we have no statement by Campion or Shakespeare of their acquaintance and possible collaboration, Campion's friendship with the Earl of Southampton is firmly established and leads to the opinion that through their mutual benefactor they could well have known each other. With regards to John Dowland, there can be no doubt. For if music and sweet poetry agree, as they must needs, the sister and the brother, then must love be great twixt thee and me. Because thou lovest the one and I the other, Dowland to thee is dear, whose heavenly touch upon the lute doth ravish human sense. Spencer to me, whose deep conceit is such as passing all conceits, needs no defense. Thou lovest to hear the sweet melodious sound that Phoebus's lute, the queen of music, makes. And I, in deep delight, am chiefly drowned when as himself to singing he betakes. 
One God is God of both, as poets feign. One night loves both, and both in thee remain. <clears throat> uh, may I read a description of another type of music in England by a foreign traveler? This castle, Windsor Castle, stands upon a knoll or hill. In the outer or first court, there is a very beautiful and immensely large church. In this church, His Highness Frederick, Duke of Württemberg, listened for more than an hour to the beautiful music, the usual ceremonies, and the English sermon. The music, especially the organ, was exquisitely played, for at times you could hear the sounds of cornets, flutes, then fifes, and other instruments. And there was likewise a little boy who sang so sweetly amongst it all and threw such a charm over the music with his little tongue that it was really wonderful to listen to him. So speaks a traveler. That traveler might have heard the following song, The Author of Light by Thomas Campion. Our soloist is Master Charles Shillito. Charles will now have to move from the choir loft onto the stage at the Globe and becomes one of the pages in As You Like It, where in Act 5, Scene 3, he sings the song, It Was a Lover and His Lass. This song was probably, is probably familiar to most of you in its madrigal form. 
However, it was first published by Thomas Morley in this version, which Shakespeare borrowed for his play. And it may have been the actual melody, too. It's very difficult to come up and perform after a child performs. And you know, only a Danny Kaye can really do it successfully. I wish I were Danny Kaye sometimes. We have tried this evening, in a somewhat limited amount of time, what is the impossible. But before we allow you to leave in peace, Mr. Conant, Master Shillitoe, and I would perform a dialogue. Tell me, O oh love. By Alfonso Ferrabasco, the younger. And I must say the younger because the older uh, took his family from Italy to England. Or rather, he took his wife. And then he had quite a few numerous children. Quite a few numerous. That's, that's good, isn't it? And anyway, he had a lot of children. And the interesting thing is that... Uh, Mr. Farabasco, the senior, just left the kids in England and went back to Italy and took his wife with him. I'd left Alfonso, at least, with a very fine musician who trained him to be a very fine composer. <coughs> uh, this Tell Me, O oh Love is a sweet, sad conversation between a shepherd and a nymph. Such a dialogue formed a part of a courtly entertainment known by various names, masks, pastoral, intermezzi, ballet de cour, and was closely allied to the new theatrical <coughs> experience developing in Italy. 
We now call it opera. Farrah Basco, the younger, collaborated with Ben Johnson and Inigo Jones in the creation and production of The Mask of Blackness, Hymnea, The Mask of Beauty, and others. Alfonso also composed the songs and incidental music for Johnson's Volpone. In our performance, needless to say, Mr. Conant will sing the part of the shepherd, and our choir boy, which was customary, will portray the nymph. Now we're very sorry, but time does not allow for us to put on costumes, nor to arrange the scenery by Mr. Jones, and you will just have to take this short little dialogue from a rather long work. Mr. Conant and Master Shillito, I will give them a plug, will both be heard in our opera workshop performance of Benjamin Britten's William Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Mr. Conant will sing the part of Snug, and Master Charles will become Mustard Seed. Would you please now imagine that you are in the garden at Windsor Castle, and that I am playing a lute, and that I am dressed like Orpheus, and that fair Charles has become a delightful nymph with all the characteristics necessary to make a shepherd fall in love with him. And now will you please also see the sweet sadness of this because the shepherd is realistic enough to know that he cannot really have a love affair with a nymph. With this, we are finished. Stay sweet love. Stay sweet love. 
and sing the song with me. Time brings to pass what love thinks could not be. Time brings to pass what love thinks could not be. Thank you, Professor Tussler. Does anyone wish to ask him any questions? Or offer to sing? <laughs> if music is to excite our appetites of raging, it is appropriate now for me to tell you that there is a law in each well-ordered nation to curb those raging appetites that are most disobedient and refractory. Professor John Bauman, Professor of Law, will talk to us next week, March 9th, on Elizabethan Legal Institutions, Persons, Precedents, and Parallels. Until then, on behalf of the faculty and the administration of UCLA, I thank you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>